Every time there's a problem, I would say directly look square at it and try to get down to what fundamental is happening happening there. Business of Architecture, episode 201. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today is the second half of my interview with Lance Psycho and Alex Gore, partners at the architecture and design firm F9 Productions, based out of Longmont, Colorado. These guys are great examples of the entrepreneurial spirit. Since starting their firm in 2009, they've grown both the size and scale of the projects they work on, including a current project that they are developing themselves. So today we talk about their latest entrepreneurial venture, a mixed-use townhome development where they're acting as the developer, architect, and builder. You'll also get to hear Lance and Alex weigh in on some of the best career advice and worst that they've ever gotten. Let's get down to business. Here's today's show. Well, let's talk about this development project that you guys are involved in. Let's jump into that now. Tell me about that. Yeah, so we we have a couple rules. Uh, and then one, I think it was from Seagal, is basically do a project within 15 minutes of, of where you are. When we built the tiny houses, uh, the two newest ones, they were about 40 minutes away. Wasn't too bad, but it was a stretch and it was kind of, there was a tight deadline. So it was really leaning on, on family time. And I just had my baby then. And the baby even went to the hospital for a week. So it, it was just, it was pretty crazy. Um, so we're doing something really really close it's probably five six minutes away and then do something that we're extremely comfortable with so we've done a whole bunch of townhomes so we're gonna do a townhome and we're doing you know uh six units on one side two units on the other side and then our then our office so it might look to maybe some investors and some other people as a as a big project but townhomes we're gonna stay in the irc and you can do single family duplex and townhomes as long as they're structurally independent so the foundation touches, but everything else is independent in, in the roof. So when you do custom homes, you know, which we also do, you know, two, three thousand, four thousand square feet, different levels, you know, uh, more richer clients like more advanced things. It's actually pretty complicated when you do a 20 foot wide by 30 foot, 36 foot deep townhome. That's a box, and you know, you do your modern touches on all that, and you repeat that eight times. That that's actually way simpler than than if you were doing like this 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 bigger home because once you nail it you're good to go uh the other thing is that the the two tiny houses that we did the new ones they if you've seen you can go to atlas tiny house that's the one from from a couple years ago but it has a fold down deck and a fold up awning which was hard enough the first time well and it was only halfway so it split the 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 height of the wall so the deck was only you know half as tall and the awning was only half as tall and there was a glass wall behind it well these new clients wanted that but they wanted the full deck so the full you know eight to ten feet to come down and be a deck and then the full ten feet to become an awning then they wanted that on the other side and these were going to be used up in the mountains so the snow load uh, tripled yeah and so the structure the weight of the structure tripled so just the feasibility i mean we had to like uh, for that project we had to get a crane and it was, yeah. it was it was crazy and then they said oh on the roof can you make a sky deck that folds down so that when we're tra- moving it you know the wind doesn't go and then we need railings up there so those all need to fold oh and then we need a detachable stairs that also folds that the railings also fold and then that times too so when I'm looking at this townhome, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. There's no, there's obviously, no, there's it won't no be. moving parts. Yeah. Um, 
So, but the the big picture of why we're why we're doing this is uh, this kind of harks back to to college as well. It, um, when, when Alex and I were in architecture school, I, I never understood why um, why architects would not want to at least try doing developments on their own once, so that they a could completely control the the project from a design standpoint. But b if you do that. You know, we're gonna we we are trying to wear three hats with this project. We're the developer, we're the contractor, and we're the architect. So the idea is we're getting paid three times, and that goes back to like learning from Jonathan Segal and what what he does. He's in complete control of the situation. Um, he's you know he's obviously he has a greater risk on the project, but with greater risk becomes greater rewards. Uh, so we do love we do love our our clients right now, but at the end of the day. The more work we can be in control of um, for us is is where we want to be. Yeah, because then we only have to deal with our egos and the city yeah, instead of our I, egos, the client. And, the city. <laughs> and Alex says I'm hard enough to deal with as it is. So yeah, right. It's uh, <laughs> tough enough with you. So I can tell. Hey, tell yeah. me, tell me about the process of buying and acquiring that land. Yeah. So we started <clears throat> we started looking for land last year at the end of last year because we knew. Uh, we knew that we were going to be done with the the second tiny house build. Um, I was also I was also licensed for about a year, and we knew that we would you know for what we wanted to do we should we should probably be licensed because it'd be a multifamily uh, project. So we started looking right next to our office about a, uh, within a half mi- within a half a half a block. That piece of property um, never came to fruition because the the money we would have had to put up was just too much. So. Um, my fiance is our real estate agent and she just kept on the hunt. Another piece of property came up and it was about a third of an acre. And <clears throat> this was our first lesson in cash is king. So at the end of the day, we, we, our goal after this development project is save as much cash as you can so that we can be the cash buyers on the on whatever next piece of property we want. So we put, we put an offer in on the piece of property that we eventually got. Uh, our offer became the second offer. And the first offer, the person who bought it, they came in with cash and they, you know, why wouldn't a, why wouldn't a seller take a cash deal? They were even lower than our offer. Yeah, they were even low. We actually offered, I, I don't know, 10, 20,000 more or something like that. There was a, there was an escalation clause in the contract. So somehow over the next six months, <clears throat> maybe it's three or four, something like that. Over the next couple months, uh, the person who bought that piece of property, um, they, they put it back on the market. Or they actually didn't put it back on the market. What they did was the guy who bought it just became physically not able to do whatever the heck he was going to do. And so he wanted to spend his time doing something else. It was gr- what was what was great about that. Him and his real estate, he, he and his real estate agent was his real estate agent got in touch with our real estate agent before they even put it on MLS and said, hey, are your guys still interested in the property? at the price they originally offered and we said yes. So it was good to be a backup offer. It never got put back up on MLS and thank God it didn't because I'm not sure we would have got it. Right now the Denver real estate market is incredibly hot. I think we're number two in the nation. Number one is Houston. So land prices are just through the roof. And so we got the land for what we wanted wanted it for, um, but we did have to take out a loan to do it. Yep. And to go into some of the nuts and bolts about getting lending is that some people think that you really can't get land loans. You got to pay for it all in cash. Um, and the reason is because most banks, your Wells Fargo, your Think Credit, you know, mo- most banks don't really do land loans. So you have to find a specific one that does it. Another reason people don't think that you do land loans is um, just think for residential for doing your own house. A lot of times you don't buy the land because you can't pay for the whole thing. So you're paying, you know, 20 percent and then you have a mortgage on it. Right. Because you have to pay the rest of it. And that even on something like $100,000 might be 500 bucks. Well, if you're just one person, that 500 bucks is is a lot, you know, especially you have college debt and all that. So I had a Lance is like, oh, we got to save up enough for the whole land. I go, no, we can we can get a loan for this. So there's there's a lender here um, and they said, yes, 20, you know, you need 20 percent down. So we had to make sure that we had 20 percent. down. Actually, it was 30. Oh, it was 30. It was yep. 30%. Yep. 30% down. So save up money for, enough money for that and kind of know what you're looking for. And then we did something. It was a, a balloon payment at the end. So it's a three-year loan, which means 
every month, we're only paying about $1,000, which our firm can handle that, right? Um, and then at the end, we have to pay a balloon payment of, you know, who knows, thousands and thousands of dollars. But hopefully in three years, everything should be sold. So that's fine. So that's how you kind of do the math to make that work is save up 30% and then do the balloon payment at the end. And you have to get lucky and find, you have to have a land, somebody that lends land in the capacity that they are for us where it's, I mean, they're do the three D they do the three year deal because they're lending to developers because they think, okay, it should take you a year to get through all the city. You should build after, build for one year and then you start selling the year after. Um, but it was, uh, we only know of this one entity in Colorado that does this. So, you know, we're, and they're in the town we're in, we're actually North of Denver by about an hour. So, um, I don't know. It's hard, but I, at the end of the day, I think anybody who's thinking about doing this cash is king, even at the lending level. And that probably, you know, that might get overlooked by people. You can't just, we, we, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they say they want to build a new house. And the first thing I ask them now is I start to vet them and say, do you have land purchased? And a lot of them don't. I mean, they just don't, a lot of people do not realize how important it is to have land purchased. Like you can't go to a bank and say, I want to build a new house. Plus I want to buy the land. They want to see a certain level of skin in the game. So for us, we always knew it was the biggest hurdle is we, if we just get land, I, th I think we can make everything else work. It's going to be a uphill battle up a mountain every single day for three years. But if we can just get the land, we're, we're on the right track. Yeah. What's the interest rate you guys are paying on that note? Oh, I think, I think it's above 10%. Yeah. Yep. I think it's around the 12 mark. Yeah, it's pretty steep. It's pretty steep. And explain, um, it's, explain to me this lender. So other people who are looking for a lender like this, um, you know, what is what is this person or this entity like so they can find someone like this? Yeah, so it, if you're in Colorado, they're Centennial Lending. Um, but I literally just had to do a Google search for land loans. Um, yeah. And they're sort of like, I would say they're a lending, but they, they don't have they're not a bank. So they even made us get an account at a local credit union that they work with. So they just, you know, if you were just searching for like bank loans, like that's probably not gonna in what it, you know, whatever town that you're in, that might not even hit on the Google search and you might not think that it's in there. So um, search, you know, land loans, ask, uh, real estate people too, if they know, and then some of them might say, "No, you can't do that." Um, but that's just because it's not done that much. That doesn't mean that you really can't do that. Um, and then when you're looking at land to, to vet which one to to buy, we've always heard all of your construction costs and all that. How much you think the project's going to cost you? Land should be under eighteen percent. And the other thing you can do is that you can go on your GIS or um, look through your county data, and you can see similar projects. And then you can look and see how much they bought the land for. So if they bought this huge plot and they're going to do fifty units, and then it turned out, oh. It costs them forty thousand dollars per unit per land. We're doing a smaller thing, but it only costs us thirty thousand dollars. Then you're like, okay, we should be safe um, too, because that I don't know about different areas. You know, California is probably crazy. Depending on where you are in California, too, Valley versus LA versus San Francisco, it's all going to change. So this this lot of land you guys are are is it? Have you broken ground on the project yet? Where are you at right now in terms of the project? We we're in site. Well, we're not even in site plan review. So we had our pre-application meeting, and then uh, the city gave us back all their comments. Then we had to do a neighborhood meeting, and we had to do the neighborhood meeting because we are doing a conditional use on the project. So right what away they want to see conditional use. Say that again. Uh, what what is triggering the conditional use? Is it the mixed use? It's a commercial. It, the 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 lot is zoned commercial, but it it has the ability to be residential so long mixed as it's use. mixed use. Yeah. So uh, it's eight condos. Just to repeat, it's eight condos and then our headquarters, our office building. So that's what throws it in. Um, so, you know, residences aren't typically going to be there. So that's kind of where we're, we're not pushing the envelope, but we're just, that's where we're going with it. So Alex had to present and I took notes. Uh, we had a, we had a community meeting. Um, there's only, there's only three citizens that showed up. They actually really loved the direction of it and everything. So we're on to the next phase. And the next phase is uh, we are going to get everything ready for our site plan development, right? Yeah. Site plan review. So we're getting all of our civils, um, landscape, all, all, you know, the architecture. You, you basically have to do the majority of the building. 
building. The only thing that you don't really have to do is you don't have to show floor plans and you don't have to do um, all the CD set and the structural set, but <laughs> you can't show the elevation, the heights, what all the materials are, where all the windows are without doing floor plans. So you're literally designing everything and making sure it works. And there's a few other costs that I think everybody else should be aware of too, if they're thinking about going down the development road. Um, so land is one thing, but then there's also out of pocket costs are gonna come. So we had to pay for <clears throat> an environmental an environmental analysis. Uh, there was a company that had to come out, they had to test the soil, see if it was a brownfield site. Um, one other one that the city, uh, we got waived from our local jurisdiction was they wanted us to do Habitat Species Conservation Plan. Yeah, and it is a, <laughs> it is a blank. This is a blank, your typical blank city lot. There's just uh, in the middle of the city. I mean, there's there's no there's nothing on it. There, I don't. Mean, there's a couple trees tops, but they're like uh, they're garbage trees. You know, there's they're not e there's not even gophers. And and we told them this, and they're like, well, we need someone professional to tell us that there's not even gophers. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's there's that out of pocket cost that might come. And then um, there's a survey. You got to get a survey done. You're actually going to have to get a survey done before you purchase the property, uh, typically, uh, because they need, you know, for in the case of us for a land loan, they wanted to make sure that um, they wanted to make sure that it was a legal piece of property and there was a legal description so they could they could take it to their investors and that we could we could do that we could do the deal. So, go ahead and make sure because th this should have been done on our side and we should have known. Um, Make sure it's technically an Alta survey. You can ask your city if you need it, but Alta is is basically what um, the real estate people need to. Not every time when you ask for a survey, they might not do the extra steps to make it that survey. So we're gonna go ha go back and do it, and it'll just be a little bit extra expense and all that. But just know, like if you are looking at a land, maybe look through the what the city needs, um, and then for the survey, it. I almost think that's the professional standard now. Uh, but just make sure you're telling your surveyor that that's what you. Want. Geotechnical, uh, a geotechnical report is going to be needed. Um, a lot of jurisdictions that we deal with now in Colorado are actually requiring them if you are doing something conditional use or you are doing something uh, or you're trying to add something to the zoning. Like you're not going for a full blown rezoning, but just add something to the zoning because they want it, the city wants to know what is what you guys you know let's say you want you're proposing to put on um a big commercial building that's like 10 stories tall right they want to know that the soil can support it before they even allow you to get to site plan development well and then i was i was trying to figure out why they wanted it besides that because I, I for site plan review it shouldn't matter you know structures doesn't even come yet and what they wanted to know also was where the water table was because they wanted to know because all of your civils are going to be done they wanted to know if they were going to have to do a, an under drain report that would have cost us a couple thousand dollars and i was meeting with the city and they said oh you have to do an under drain report and i go well the water table you know we'll see but the water table shouldn't be close and you don't have to um if the water table is going to be close to the foundation because you don't have to worry about what's going to happen there they said well are you doing crawl spaces so yeah we're doing crawl spaces like well you're doing something undergrade you have to do it and then i go well let's bring up the the city code and it was habitable habitable spaces underground so habitable okay that's seven foot you know, and also it's normally filled in by gypsum, um, and that's what defines a habitable space. And they're like, "Oh yeah, you don't have to do it then." So, like, but but if you didn't know that, like, that's where you can get stuck with. Oh, there's another two thousand dollar expense yeah. that you have to do. Um, just be, just because the codes are so complicated, you know, there's so much to know, and and even though the city should know it, now I'm I'm talking discussing with the city. They mentioned in our neighborhood meeting that our setbacks need to be changed. He mentioned this rule that for um, every two and a half foot in height, you have to be one foot away from the property. So I'm like, oh wow, that's really going to mess up our project. And I am double checking the code, and that's a residential standard, but we're in a commercial district, so you know there's 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 always these plays and it, it could get quite tricky so i think those are the um and then i've had a client recently <clears throat> where we're they're also a developer and they are kind of doing what we're doing in the sense of uh, the way it's going through through the city the typology of the project is different 
But the way they've structured their land deal is it's structured like they won't purchase until they know that it's going to be rezoned. That's kind of made everybody edgy um, from the sell on the, on the from the seller side of everything, and rightly so uh, because there's a lot of money riding on it. But some of the extra expenses that they've had to uh, incur are civil engineering, um, civil engineering, more surveys, and then all the architecture and engineering fees. So <clears throat> I think the, the other idea about architects doing developments um, on their own is that if you if you are giving a lot of work, repeat work to and referring other engineers that you work with constantly, I would hope that there would be um, a, you get you can you could get a better fee from them on your project because there's just this there's just this good 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 boy relate you know good old boy relationship back and forth. Whereas I'm not sure a lot of developers could have that kind of advantage. So you know knowing that you're going to have to do all these make possible extra, extra expenses up front is one thing, but I think I think there are ways that we that we can we're going to be able to save money that other people might not be able to. Mm-hmm. So we're not including the land, uh, what's your estimate order of magnitude for the the money out of pocket that you guys have had to come up with when you look at the geotech reports, when you look at the survey you had to do, some of these other unexpected things that you weren't necessarily planning on, you know, we, what are we talking in terms of So this is a, a small project. Um, but I think will be at least 30 to 50,000 dollars not including land. Yeah. Including all of the engineers once it's once it's said and done, yeah, it, it will match. And this is on. And to put it in perspective, this is on a third of an acre. And I think what would you have? What's your current estimate for construction costs? One point two million. One point two. One point two million. Yeah. So we had to put in about sixty k to get the land, and we think we're going to put in another sixty k to handle all the other engineers. Every all the other stuff that we talked about, not including our fees. I mean, the idea is at the end we recruit our fees at the very end. Here, some interesting some interesting things that we've learned from banks so far, and we've only had two meetings with banks so far because um, we're just taking this step by step. But uh, Jonathan Segal is one hundred percent right in that. If you come with a set of approved drawings, they treat it as cash, which is incredible. Um, so you can treat that as a, as an asset. So the, uh, so not only are all the time like the bank will recognize in a reasonable percentage of the construction cost that you could defer getting paid for those fees in in lieu of okay, do you see that as like this is part of our down payment to get the construction loan? Same thing goes for a developer fee. You can charge a developer fee on top of your architecture fee and defer that cost. And then the same thing for a contractor fee. So as a first time developer, we are hoping (laughs) that all three of those things, which we want to equal 30% if you add them all up, can go towards us not having to have as much cash as somebody else would when we go for the construction loan. Yeah. So if you take uh, 1.2 million, let's just say a million dollars just to be easy. And let's say you have to have 30%. So that's $300,000. Um, and with a development, like a million dollars is actually low. So people are probably talking in like the $2 million. So you may be, may be like close to half a million dollars in cash. So one of the things that we're going to try to do and we think that we can do from contractor costs, it can easily be anywhere from 10 to 15 to 17 percent when we're going to do it we're going to do it basically at cost so instead of charging you know a specific price or marking up all the materials and having a profit we'll charge you know just 25 bucks to hours per hour just to just to feed it's it's literally no overhead no profit in that whatsoever um and then that extra you know 200 three 300 thousand that the contractor would normally get we delay that to the end and that counts as our cash input so then you know that takes care of at least half of of what we have to bring up bring to the table so we do think we are going to have to raise a, a several you know a, a fair amount of money when it's all said and done no matter what um so- and enoch he told me that he'd do that all at a low percentage rate <laughs> <laughs> he said five percent al you can wow, have the cash that, that's crazy that's crazy <laughs> Good guy. <laughs> but yeah, so we have started talking to investors. So I think, um, you know, the ideal goal is you eventually are able to wear one more hat and maybe after this first deal to where you're also the cash investor. So now you're now you're wearing four hats. And again, you're taking more risk, but then the return comes back fourfold instead of threefold. Yeah. More risk, more return. Yeah. More responsibility, more return. And so you guys have started talking to a couple banks yet, but you haven't actually started the process of getting financing for the project. 
you going to do that when? Uh, pretty soon here, probably in a couple of weeks, we met with one person that might be a heavy investor. And then honestly, there's there's three to four reputable online um, fundraising. And I'm not talking about Kickstarter. I'm talking specifically for real estate um, that, that we might also pr- pr- pursue um, for some of that. What's cool about our investors. What's, yeah, what's cool about them is... Um, again, if, like if you're an architect doing this, you have complete control over the marketing, right? So you could spend your own time and your own effort and your own money getting putting the renderings together and selling the project, maybe doing an animation and floor plans and stuff, put it up online. So, you know, that's where it comes. I really think like the sex could sell your, your project, right? Because you're creating these really cool, these really cool spaces and this great, this great architecture. So, you know, I don't know, we're, 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 we're nervously excited to go down that road of how are we going to finance this thing. But like I said, the biggest at the beginning or at the beginning of this conversation was, gosh, the land was the hardest part. I just I just know that was you just had to get get the land secured and it'll happen. I know it'll happen. And another thing is no matter what what you're doing, I don't think you can predict and know how to do everything. So even Elon Musk with, you know, creating rockets. Of course, the, he's a genius and, and, and we'll figure it out. But <clears throat> there's something to entrepreneurials where it, it's sort of like a, a blind ignorance where you just kind of go in hoping and as long as you know and can handle the first step, then you hope you, that you can handle the second step and the third step. And then, of course, with us and, and a lot of people too, is that, okay, this might be a new route, but it's not like it's not anything that we haven't done. It's not like we haven't designed many of these. It's not like we haven't built a lot in, in our past. It's not like we haven't had management skills and all that. It's just you're combining them in a, in, a, in a new route. So know that there will be this fog of war. And that's where the term comes from. But that doesn't mean that you know war isn't going to happen and that you shouldn't take that leap whatsoever. Yeah, and I think any other architects uh, who, who want to jump into this development scheme, it would behoove them. I would hope that you have good relationships with the developers that you're working with. So it would, be, it would behoove you to not just go out and take that developer out for coffee and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing what you're doing. And just ask them as, uh, as many questions as you can about the business side of things. And I have, we've had no problem um, with getting those meetings and they've had no problem telling us all the information um, at the end of the day and what we want to do. Um, so it, that even goes down to one of the developers we work with, I said, hey, who sets up your uh, HOAs? And how do you set up your uh, the construction the construction side uh, contracts and everything with, with the buyers of your, of your product? And he goes, oh, I got the perfect lawyer for you. So he's now. So now we're gonna meet with his lawyer, and he's gonna help us set up the HOA. You know, because condos are high risk, so we want to be we want to have make sure everything's secured in that way. But um, I don't know. It just kind of goes back to I don't think I don't think it ever hurts to ask any anybody you're working with those kind of questions. And then and then the final thing about you know learning from other developers is if you're working with them, you already know the whole process. You you should at that point know the whole process of what it's gonna take to get through the city, especially if you're the architect and you're at the umbrella of everybody else is underneath you, you know, all the other engineers and stuff have been hired. You've seen exactly what the heck the city's gonna ask um, for better or for worse and how you can fight back about some things and say, hey, do we really have to do we really have to do this environmental, uh, this habitat thing? No, not really. Okay, good. Because of previous experiences on other projects where the other developers have tried to, you know, reduce those uh, things from the city. Yeah. And then also, um, I think if you met developers, I'm sure they're smarter, th- you know, all that. But I don't think a lot of architects think that these developers are out of their league. I don't think this is a intellectual knowledge based thing where it, it, where you can't handle because I think our society is an action based society. It's not only an intellect based society. So you need to point your actions in that direction and then just reduce and close that feedback loop. Yeah. So know the client. And, and, and the faster that you can close that feedback loop and just keep keep iterating on that, especially for the things that you don't know, um, people, especially if you've been a good architect helping helping other people, they'll give you that information. They'll tell you about fees. They'll tell you about whatever. So so just know that I, I really think it's action orientation and, and getting that. Feedback and those loop developers, closer. those developers might even want to be investors in your project. That's the other thing is. If you are doing, if if they already believe is they are, they've already hired you and believe as you believe in you as the architect, that you're going to help them create products that they can sell for profit. So if you're if you're taking that approach with your project, 
I, 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 I would get, I would, I would venture to guess that some of them would potentially even want to be investors on the capital side. Of and, and some of ours are on the south side of Denver, where we're on the north side of Denver. And if you're, it's a big enough city where that's an hour and a half away. There's no way where <laughs> I'm never doing anything down there. You're never doing anything up here. So it's not, you're not really competing. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of investors, what kind of deal are you looking at to close that gap in the funding that you're going to need? Because you're going to need some extra cash for this deal. Uh, have you started talking to investors? And if so, what kind of terms are you guys thinking is going to work to make that close that gap? So there's two different ways that you can approach it. You can get a hard money lender where that's all they're doing. They're just giving you money and they want within a year, they want to return on that or maybe even a two year on a bigger project. And then there's a partner. The partner um, is where we're trying to avoid because the hard money lender, we're hopefully that we can give terms at around 18% of whatever cash you get in. So you give us the cash, you sit back, you're going to beat the stock market. Um, here you go. Easy, easy money. Um, the partners will probably want a percentage of the of the profit. Um, and if you can only get money that way, that's all what you can do. But they can cut into that profit. I've heard numbers up to 50 percent, 30 percent. You know, that's huge. And especially when if you're doing it our way where you're carrying all these hats and you're leaving the profit, you know, for later just to make sure like this is foolproof. Even if the market drops, your money is not at risk. And even with the hard money lender, what basically happens is that the hard money comes out first. So let's say Enoch, you gave a hundred and we put in a hundred. Okay. So that comes out first, no matter what. And then the 18% comes out um, after that. So everyone gets their actual dollars back. You know, um, to quote Shark Tank, you don't want your money soldiers to die. So at least you're guaranteeing that that comes back. Yeah. Nice. Let's get some more of those money soldiers working. Yeah, no absolutely. <laughs> All right, guys. So very cool. Well, that kind of wraps it up for today. Um, you know, you did say you sent me a copy of your book, but it came back to you. Tell me about the book, Alex. Yeah. So uh, the, the book is called The Creativity Code. Um, and basically, we not only teach architecture students, we teach engineering stu students at CU. And we are brought in because they have to do a design project at the end. And they basically they were doing it as an engineer. They were making a whole bunch of boxes that were very efficient. And the program saw that and said, well, that's not how the real world works. And what happened is, you know, like we do, like you do, is you try to give out all this information. So we gave these engineering students, you know, our basically our whole firm's resources. We gave them a template. We gave them all the architectural Legos that you could ever need. And they created some truly amazing stuff. Uh, we'd have the architecture professors come over and they'd say, man, I want these kids in my third year studio. Like, what grade are they in? Like, these are freshmen that have never designed before in their life, and that's why they want to be engineers. Um, so what we did is we put those lessons and then other lessons in that book to kind of un un unleash the creativity through what, what people don't think is, they don't think they have it, but the power of visualization, just writing things down, knowing how to sketch, knowing how to think visually can unleash so much potential that I think people naturally have in them. People learn visually, people see visually, um, you know, they uh, a picture is worth a, a thousand words. So even those people who don't think that they're creative, I think once they just are given some just common tools, some common thoughts and talk about the architectural process and talk about, you know, aligning and grouping all this stuff that we're very familiar uh, concepts in architecture, they can be a applied in visualizing a whole broad range of subjects um, that, you know, a lot of times architecture tries to take stuff from from other industries, from the medical industry and, and engineering. I think we have stuff to offer back to the rest of the world too. And that's, that's kind of what the book is about. Well, just to wrap this up, guys, why don't you tell me your answers to the two questions you sent me, which is number one, what's the worst career advice you've gotten? And what's the best? Lance, we'll start with you. Oh, gosh. That was, that's on the fly. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, well, I'm asking because I figured you must have thought about it before. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you would think so. You would think so since we're asking that question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Worst career advice I've ever got. Oh, so I was in, uh, I had an interview in Boulder. Um, and the worst career advice I ever got was 
uh, the guy said he wouldn't hire me because I'm like betting on a racehorse. And I, I didn't know what to take from that um, at all. I mean, it kind of, it really threw me for a loop and that I it wouldn't hire me because, uh, <laughs> because I wouldn't, I, I hadn't been to Europe yet um, and seen any of the architecture. So for at the end, I guess I just used that as fuel to do what we're doing today because I thought like, well, then don't bet on this racehorse. This racehorse, I'm going to team up with this racehorse right next to me. Um, we're going to race, we're going to race to the finish line and, and, be, and beyond. Um, the best, the best advice, uh, business advice I ever got is probably just Alex and I reiterating, never forget about the fundamentals. Um, at, fun, at the fundamental level, at the end of the day, what we are producing is lines on paper that have to translate into a building and we need to make sure that those lines are correct um, when we have to go back and, and, and start construction. Yep. The worst advice I got, we were, when we started, we were only charging $40 per hour. And one guy said, why don't you do this? He acted like this was the best advice ever. Charge $20 for, per hour. Do a great job and you'll look like the smartest guy in the room. And I go, I was like, that is terrible because you know, you can't raise, you can't double your fees the next year. So we have consistently raised our fees around inflation mark, right? Um, so if I lowered myself to 20, it'd take me two to three years back to get to where I was at that point at $40 per hour. So I just thought that, that was that was terrible. The best I got, and especially if you're a little bit young or insecure or, or think you don't know the answer, uh, Lance's old boss said, whenever you're dealt a problem, take it head on, approach it head on. So. Let's say the city says, hey, you need to do an under drain report because, you know, there's space under under it. Go look at the code. There's not. Hey, can we look at the code? You know, you can do it in, in a nice way. Um, a lot of times you'll get calls from clients and they'll say, hey, this foundation doesn't work or whatever. Um, and that can be scary if, if you think that you don't you know construction or anything like that. Hey, let's let's look directly at the drawings. Let's see what the drawings say. And a lot of times it was they just don't know where it is on the drawings. Honestly, that's half of the questions like, oh, did you go to page A5? They're like, oh, there it is. Thank you. Bye. You know, like that's it. So every time there's a problem, I would say direct look square at it and try to get down to what fundamental is happening happening there awesome guys well it's been a pleasure having you on business of architecture today lance psycho and alex gore awesome having you guys as always yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot um it was great yeah thanks a lot for the interview we appreciate it and that is a wrap thank you for listening today if you're looking for more time freedom impact and income as an architect Get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.